our Crave series. Thank you for tuning in and plugging in wherever you are right now. Um, this is just a journey that we're on to see if our cravings uh, can connect us to a deeper reality, maybe a connection with Jesus or, or just some, something bigger outside of ourselves. And uh, once again, uh, just welcome. Thank you for joining us wherever you are, um, sitting, watching alone, or maybe with friends and family. I, I just invite you right now, we're just going to uh, bow our heads and, and just have a prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for this opportunity, this moment that we have to, to maybe discuss something that, that could mean something to us. And we pray, Lord, that we may be able to see uh, truth in a different way. And just once again, thank you for this time and this moment. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so in our last session, Josh, you guys remember Josh? Yes, he did. He's good, eh? Uh, Josh shared with us that there is some scientific data out there that humans are psychologically and biologically, we are, we are engineered for love, to, to give love and receive love. But whenever you start talking about love amongst people, um, you, you run into the dilemma that now we need to talk about uh, integrity, Keep, keeping your word, uh, faithfulness, trustworthiness. In, in other words, um, we're looking at that concept of do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. That's what happens whenever we, we talk about love. And, and, and this concept uh, goes a little further. That, that whole thing is called um, uh, morality, moral right. There's a right way to have relationships and a wrong way. There's a way that we can hurt people, and there's a way that we can love others. So we begin our conversation uh, looking at Sigmund Freud. If you've heard of this guy, he is the father of psychotherapy. If you've ever seen a movie or a show and you have someone lying on, the, on a couch talking about uh, their parents or their childhood, you can thank Freud for that. Um, in fact, Freud's biggest passion was to find out what made humans tick at their deepest level. And at the same time, he was a staunch advocate of atheism. He was against believing God. He, he actually went out and said that science, time and time again, rules out belief in God. And therefore, if there is no belief in God, there are no objective categories of right and wrong. But this is what happens to Freud. After a lifetime of atheistic certainty, uh, something unexpected happens in Freud's own psyche in his own mind, in his way of thinking. Uh, towards the end of his life, uh, Freud says something really curious, kind of out of character for him. He says, he spoke of strange and secret longings for a life of quite a different kind. What's he talking about? What, what, what is he, what is going on there? Um, he begins to feel, this, this is someone describing his life, he began to feel on an emotional level that something that he had suppressed his whole life, maybe a craving, science began to fail his atheism. So this, this is Freud in his own words. He says, the bad part of it is, especially for me, lies in the fact that science of all things seems to demand the existence of God. So Freud, one of these guys who, even till today, is known as one of the uh, most ardent defenders of atheism ran into an issue, a principle that someone else, uh, Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon uh, from the Enlightenment says this really key thing when it comes to science. He says, a little knowledge of science makes a man an atheist, but an in-depth study makes him a believer in God. So this is where we start our conversation. Uh, Freud devoted, uh, devoted himself to atheism, and yet at the end, he was empty-handed, empty-hearted, and he had a strange, secret longing, maybe for God, even as he tried to understand and wrestle with that. So, like Freud, like Freud, many of us, many, many people today struggle with the notion of God. 
just the, just the concept at all of God. In fact, for some, for some of us, it's, it's even something repulsive. And there are good reasons that, we, that some would struggle with this concept of God. You just have to look at all the brutality that's going on in the world today. You just have to uh, turn on the news and see all the suffering that's happening. And, and to make matters worse, uh, many of these horrible things that are happening are done in the name of God. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, we're going to grab this concept of God. Just think of everything that you've thought that you've been, that you've seen about God, whether it's in the media, whether it's in your own personal experience, and we're going to put it in a place, um, we're, we're going to call it the God box, okay? Um, let's, let's see what's in the God box. Let, let's take a look. So in the God box, we're going to put everything that is intellectually unbelievable, unreasonable goes in there. Just emotionally repulsive things that, ha that have been said that God does, they, they, they go in there. I just, just, to, just to get real with you, not to ruffle any feathers, but nearly every politician says they believe in God. So <laughs> right there, that's, that's a reason to, to be worried. Most, most suicide bombers Acts done in, in terrorism are done in the name of God. If, if you're a history buff, you just look through history and you see atrocities time and time again. And they're done because of religious devotion. We keep looking at history. Um, uh, churches in the Middle Ages waged wars. They called them the Crusades. They were wars against Muslim countries. And they were done in the name of, of God. Again, uh, churches in the Middle Ages, the church in the Middle Ages, would, would even uh, go after burning millions of people of its own people simply because they believed something different. They call them, they call them heretics. So we can get even a little more detailed in this God box. In, the, in, in this God box, there are things that are said about God that go against our very own sense of justice. One of the things in here is a, is a belief in an eternal hell, that there is a place where people burn forever and ever, and nothing short of, of what can be called torture. And, and, and right behind uh, this concept of eternal hell, it's also the concept that, that it is God who, who predetermines who is going to be saved and who is going to be lost. So if God really is all-powerful, in a sense, God is unilaterally picking who is going to be tortured for millions of years and who experiences bliss. So yeah, there are some horrible things in the God box. And so if you were a rational human being, you would look at these things. You would look at religious deeds, right? Actions throughout history, even modern actions. Um, you would look at dogmas. And as an intelligent person, you would need to say, I don't believe in that God. I don't want to believe in that God. That would actually be the intelligent solution because how could you expect people to love and worship a monster like that? So we're going to do a little uh, intellectual exercise here. Um, please, please indulge me. What if, what if God, what if God looks at all these um, diabolical things that have been done in the name of God and says, nope, that's, that's not who I am. What if, in a sense, God is himself an atheist when it comes to those gods? We're, imagine, imagine this. Imagine this. This is a story to just kind of help. Imagine this um, of an awkward conversation where the subject of God comes up. It comes up between uh, two random people, okay? Let's, let's, let's pretend the story uh, happened before, before COVID, okay? Let's say there's a guy, uh, his name is Justin, okay? Justin is on his way to get his haircut. He goes to the salon, and uh, who's, who's the hairdresser that day? It's a, it's a young lady. Let's call her Jessica, and, uh, you know, the, the eye contact's made. Okay, you'll I'll cut your hair. You know that small talk that happens when you're getting your hair cut? Yeah, it starts there. And then she, she has some, some visual, like, frustrated. She's visually frustrated. 
can you believe that happened again? And Justin's like, no, what? It's, it's all over the news, says Jessica. Another one of those religious nuts just murdered a bunch of people. And of course, he did it for God. So Justin's in the chair. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's terrible. And Jessica, kind of on a roll, says, but you're not like one of those people, right? You don't believe in God, do you? Here's the a, here's a difficult part. Uh, Justin does actually believe in God. He is a follower of Jesus. But in that moment, it is, it is so difficult. It is so awkward because if he acknowledges that he, that he believes in a supreme being, he is tying himself up to a monstrous God. So he says, are you kidding? Of course not. Who says Jessica? Me neither. What a relief. But then Justin's thinking, thinking a little bit longer. You know what? I, I, should, I, should, really, I should really come clean because I, I am a believer. I, I should come clean. So, so he, says, he says to Jessica, again, this is just a story we're talking about. He says to Jessica, but, but wait. Um, but wait. Describe for me the God you don't believe in. What a strange question. Jessica says, what? What, what are you talking about? Would describe the God that I don't believe him. Um, no, he's like, yeah, I know. I'm just curious. I just want to know what God you don't believe in. The, the God that's in your mind that you don't believe. What, what, what God is that? Describe him to me. She's like, all right, all right. I'll, I'll indulge you. Well, you know, he's a, he's a super powerful, supreme being, uh, lives in the sky. He's up there with a with maybe a big red zap button, and when people don't do what, what he wants, he, he, he zaps them, and, and he probably likes that. He decides who will be saved, who will be lost, because he has to be in charge. He has to be in control. And, and, and people that don't follow his way, well, he burns them alive in hell forever. And, and people that don't follow what he does, he tells his worshipers to go and, and, and murder them. Whoa, says, says Justin. Yeah, I definitely do not believe in the God that you describe. And Jessica's like a little bit confused. So you do believe in God or you don't believe in God? Well, well, I, I do and I don't. You do, but you don't? What are you talking about? You're crazy. Just, just explain it. And then so Justin's like... Now kind of like uh, taking a deep breath, he's, he's, he's going to reach out a little bit. He's, he says, well, maybe it's, it's not crazy. He's like, just, just, let me, just let me explain. Maybe it's not crazy. Let, let me ask you another question, Jessica. What if God could exist who is nothing like the God that you just described, but the exact opposite of, of what you described? What if, what if God was a supreme being, like you said, but who is love? Who would never inspire his followers to murder others for him. Who stands against those who actually do those things. A God of, of justice who will make all wrong things right. A God who would never ever think of torturing people because his nature is love. If, if there was a God like that, Jessica, would, would you want him to exist? And Jessica's a little confused. Well, well, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that would be amazing. amazing. I, I would have, have to be a complete, complete fool not, not to want, want God, God like, that like that to exist. So Justin says, so both of us are atheists in the sense that neither of us believe in the monstrous God you have described. And the only difference between you and me is that I do believe in the very God that you do you want to believe? And so this is, this is the situation that many of us find ourselves into. Um, Rowan Atkinson, uh, known for playing Mr. Bean. Have you seen the Mr. Bean? Yeah. He's actually done quite a bit of stuff. Black Adders, maybe one, one of his favorite things. One of the consistent themes in Rowan Atkinson's acting life has been, he's always been poking fun at religion. 
It's very, it's very witty. It's, it's very hard-hitting. And so he was being interviewed, and Rowan Atkinson actually says something uh, very deep. Mr. Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean went deep, all right? This, this is what he says. What is wrong with inciting intense dislike of a religion if the activities or teachings of that religion are so outrageous, irrational, and abusive of human rights that they deserve to be intensely disliked? I think Mr. Bean's on point. I think Rowan Atkinson is on point there. Do you, can, can we hear what he's saying? He's saying, there is no point. I mean, this, this is kind of a little message to Christians that he gives them right there. He says, there is no point in you arguing uh, philosophically, scientifically, apologetically, whatever you want to call it. There's, there's no point in arguing in the existence of God if, if, if the God you're defending is a monster. If the God you're defending is that God that lives in, in people's minds of the supreme being who is out to get you. So this, this actually raises the question. If there was a God, if there was a God of irresistible beauty, if on the other hand, there's a God of irresistible beauty, goodness, and love, would we want that God to exist? And so right here, we have, we have this primal uh, question when it comes to reality. The very fact, the very fact that we are having this question and thinking that there is an evil, monstrous God, or there could be a good, just, loving God, the, the, the very concept that we could think of right and wrong that, that we could think of things as, as being beautiful or being destructive. The very thought that we can do that, that's called uh, a moral conscience. That's actually one of our deepest human cravings. The fact that we could even imagine that. I'll just get it. I'll mention three people. And uh, you tell me what these three people have in common. We have uh, Tiger Woods. Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Christian, uh, Kristen Stewart. What do those three people have in common? Kind of celebrities, right? Um, they were actually all, uh, they all committed acts of relational infidelity. They, they cheated on their spouses. And here's, here's what gets me about that is uh, the secular media. So this is, this is media that has no, no concept of any kind of uh, religious thing or, or God thing. And yet people through the media were publicly outraged at the wrong thing that they did. Articles over and over again. What you did was wrong. What you did was wrong. The people you betrayed. The people that you hurt. Of course, when, when you say that, it raises a question. Who are we to say what they did was wrong? Unless... You have something deep inside you that gives you certainty that there are some things that are right and wrong. Now, we, 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 we can look a little further. When it comes to the political world, when it comes to the political, every, every time there's an election season coming on, do you know what's in the news? It's all about moral outrage. This is a good candidate. This is a bad candidate. This is what they did. This is what they didn't do. Uh, Rolling Stones magazine has a great article. Rolling Stones, by the way, which is a, a magazine uh, based for rock and roll culture, and it's always been about uh, hedonism, completely secular, devoid of any kind of connection with God. And yet, in the last election cycle, we're talking about the U.S. election cycle, they ran article after article about how politicians, corrupt politicians, ought not to be doing this or should be doing this. And on one particular article, it says that such things that certain politicians are doing are bad examples for our children. What's happening there is suddenly Rolling Stones is pushing morality, a moral standard. They're acknowledging that there is a right and there is a wrong, and they're saying even politicians need, <laughs> need to abide by that. Uh, author in the scriptures, his name is uh, Paul, and Paul says this, what may be known of God is manifest in human beings, for God has shown it to them. 
What does that mean? God, um, Paul is speaking to this innate moral sensibility that's inside of us. This sense of good versus evil. That somehow uh, each one of us walks around with this concept of what you ought to do and what we ought not to do. So if you were to get on a bus here in Red Deer, and uh, there, is an, if there is an elderly lady, and, and, and she is struggling, um, taking these weak steps, and there is one last seat on that bus. And then you see a, a, a young man, uh, fit as a fiddle, do people still say that? Um, strong and spry and energetic, and he just shoves his way past the old lady, come on, and, and sits on that seat. What goes on inside of your spirit? You know that was wrong. You know something else should happen. But how? How do you know? How do you know? Unless it's something deep inside of you that's telling you that there's a right and there's a wrong. Uh, King Solomon, ancient King Solomon, he gets at this when, when he says this. He says, God has placed a sense of eternity in human hearts. He's trying to tell us that we have something bigger um, it's still, maybe it's a conscience, maybe it's a moral conscience to tell us the difference between right and wrong. It's the way that we can understand and receive love, know the difference between what is loving and, and what is selfish. This moral sense is something that we see, and it's pricked every time and time again, maybe in the face of politicians, maybe in the face of injustice, because it's at our basic relational sphere as human beings. Um, some have called this, by the way, when things are wrong and they shouldn't be, some have called this the correspondence principle. We have an author. We're going to be mentioning this author throughout our Creed series. His name was C.S. Lewis. And this is what he says when he talks about the correspondence principle. He says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Man feels sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire with no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. So what, what C.S. Lewis is talking about there, in, in, in another way of saying this, is he's saying that we were wired as human beings for love, for something else. When we see that something doesn't match, it's, it's a hint that there is something else going on. Uh, John Foreman, the front man for Switchfoot, he says this, uh, sings a song. He says, the shadow proves the sunshine. We, uh, another way of saying this is the design of a glove proves the existence of the shape of the hand. A footprint in the soil provides uh, proves the existence that a foot put it there. So there's, there's a longing in there that we are not connecting with. The, the existence of any beauty at all suggests that there is a perfect beauty that exists out there that we can aspire to. The existence, this, this is good, the existence of any love at all is, is proof that there is a faithful perfect love that is, exists out there. There's, um, his name is Thomas Cahill, uh, the historian, and in his book, Desire of the Everlasting Hills, he suggests something that has to do with, with our innate sense of morality of right and wrong. This is what he says. Human beings are possessed of an unrelenting desire for the cycle of violence and horror in our world to end and give way to a mode of existence defined by beauty Truth and justice. So what he's doing is he's looking throughout history. He's a historian. And he's looking throughout history. And he's seeing that at almost every snapshot of history, human beings are struggling against something towards freedom. They are struggling against despotic powers. They are struggling against to end violence and harm for something better. Why? 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 Why is this happening? Because there are only two answers to all this. The reason that you know what's right and wrong, 
The reason that throughout history we've struggled for justice, there are two, two possibilities. It would seem then that there are either true, two possibilities that are true. We are, we are either, as humans, biological survival machines, in which case self-preservation is the highest law of our existence. That's either true or we are creatures of a divine image, in which case love is the highest law of our being. Those are the two possibilities right there. So if we are biological beings, okay, and I think in a sense we are, but if all we are is biological beings and all we live by is animal instincts, any love that you've ever felt for anything, maybe it's taking care of your kids, maybe it's taking care of, of a lover or a friend, any love that you've experienced is only a social construct is only a cultural illusion, and behind it is nothing more than self-preservation. Love isn't real. But, but, here, here's the but. But, if we are more than biology, then we are moral creatures with a spiritual dimension to our identities, a spiritual dimension that has to do with, our, with the image of God where we were created to desire perfect love, to give perfect love. Then our moral sense of right and wrong and ought to and ought not to is grounded in the reality of who we actually are, which means we are created in the image of God. Every time that we take in the world around us, we need to decide for ourselves, who am I? Do we believe that we are simply here for self-preservation? Or is there a higher purpose? Or when we think of that God box, who is God? <laughs> is God someone who's, who's this brutal, vindictive, ugly, horrible supreme ruler, or is there perhaps a God out there who is perfect love, who is for me, who loves me? And how would we react to that? How would that affect our relationships? Is any of the love that we give to each other, is it just an illusion? Or is it a deeper love that connects and builds onto others? So we will end with Freud. We started with Freud. And uh, at the end of his life, as Freud is, is thinking over everything and he's, as he's growing old and he's looking back in retrospect, he found himself, as we said, uh, possessed by this strange secret longing for quite another kind. And what we're talking about here in our Craze series, we're suggesting that maybe this deeper secret Longing for something more is, 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 is a longing, is a craving for something better, something more beautiful, something more just, something true and good. And perhaps our humanity, we were designed that we are at our deepest level craving God. And what would happen if we were to cherish and nurture that craving Nurture those desires. I'd encourage you to do that throughout our Crave series and encourage you to tune in again tomorrow as we continue on our journey through Crave. But right now, I invite you for a, um, a word of prayer if you're so inclined. Dear God, we thank you, Jesus, for these desires. And we pray, God, that they may grow in their volume, that we may be able to experience uh, truest love, and we thank you, God, for this, this time and this place that we can connect. And pray, God, that you, that you bless and continue to speak. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.